Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Earlier this month, we had some data out showing that companies are posting fewer job openings this year and employees are quitting less as unemployment has begun creeping up from low levels, uh, signaling the end of the historically tight labor conditions that characterize the rapid recovery from the pandemic shock. We, shock. we talked a little bit about some of the softness earlier with Michael McKenzie and Michael uh, McKee about the labor market, what we're seeing. Well, our next guest has a take on the labor market, specifically on jobs and finding a job that is fulfilling. Let's get to Dr. Tessa West, professor of psychology at NYU. Her new book is Job Therapy, Finding Work That Works For You. Dr. West joins us from New York City. Dr. West, great to have you here on Bloomberg Business Week. Why write this book? People are miserable at work, and quite honestly, they have no idea why. I think, you know, if you ask people, why don't you like your job anymore? What's changed since the pandemic? They'll come up with a ton of little reasons, but they're actually really struggling to come up with the reason, and more importantly, what it would take to make them happy at work. So this book is really about finding answers to that deep question. Is liking a job generational? And the reason I ask is because I remember early on in my career. Ooh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> uh, you know, looking for a job that I, I, I would tell people that I wanted to find a job. This was before I was like when I was in college, I think like I wanted to, you know, find a job that I liked. And I, you know, previous well, generations, yeah. earlier generations would say to me, it's a job. It's not supposed to be fun. It's a job. This is work. Is it like a millennial thing that we're supposed to like our jobs? Millennial, Gen Z, I think younger generations, they don't necessarily just want to like their jobs. They don't want to feel miserable at work. They don't want to have high blood pressure from their jobs. They don't want to get, you know, all these kinds of pre-existing health conditions from work. So I think... Uh, the discourse around what your job can actually do to you and how it can affect your health has definitely changed with younger generations where they're not just looking for purpose, but they're looking for jobs that are not going to actually stress them out as much as I think the older generations who are kind of just much more accepting of feeling miserable at work and then leaving it at work when they went home at the end of the day. All right. So wait, there's totally not liking your job. And then there's being stressed at your job. I love my yeah. job, but I definitely have days where I'm stressed. So like there's a, are you telling about people who are like in a job and they're like, I hate every minute of it. Is that mm -hmm. what we're talking about? I think both are true. So what's fascinating is I think there's a whole category of people who are highly identified with their jobs. Their jobs define who they are. So good days make them feel about the good about themselves as a person, bad days the opposite, but they actually hate that. Um, they are high on what we call kind of identity centrality at work. My work defines me, but low on satisfaction. I hate the thing that defines me. And I think that's the dangerous category to be in is to feel like something kind of owns you, but you don't like it at the same time and you don't know how to get out of it. You don't know how to break that cycle. Okay. Are, are you saying like if somebody doesn't like their job, the first reaction, you know, if they told someone that would be get another job. But you actually argue that there are some tools that you can use to stay at your current job, but do you like your job more. How do you do it? I think the tendency to kind of just want to jump from job to job um, isn't getting us anywhere. I think you need to first kind of understand why you dislike it. What is the psychological source of your unhappiness? And in the same way you would evaluate a marriage that's going wrong, you would think to yourself, okay, what's up? Is it that we aren't communicating? Am I not getting feedback? Have I drifted apart? Do I no longer recognize you? You know, am I having an identity crisis? What's the kind of deep underlying meaning behind those feelings? And you need to understand those before you can improve your current job or before you can even start kind of networking to figure out what you want next. And that's the step that most most of us actually skip in this kind of job hunting process. That seems crucial, right? You don't just, you're unhappy, just leave. You've got to figure out what is it that makes you unhappy because you might actually like where you are, but just not the particular job that you're in. Um, all right. So give us a checklist. I'm just thinking people who are listening and they're like, okay, so that sounds like it's number one. If you're not happy, figure out why you're not happy. 
Yeah, dig deep. You, there's a couple of quizzes I give you in this book. You can start by figuring out how strongly you identify with this career. If you still want this to be part of who you are, if you want it to define you, then what are those steps you're going to need to take to actually figure out why you're not getting ahead, why you can't get promoted, you know, why people aren't communicating with you. And I think one kind of crucial part of this is taking a look in the mirror and actually asking yourself critical questions like, am I taking on roles and responsibilities that maybe make me known to the boss, make me visible at work, but aren't actually helping me get ahead. Um, little communication gaps can be closed, like, was I promised a job that wasn't delivered to me? At what stage was that promise made? You know, where was that miscommunication kind of coming from? Did it start at the hiring stage, onboarding later on? Really kind of figuring out in that timeline of your career, those problems started to occur and how much of that is for you to blame and how much of that is your career. Really treating your career as a relationship partner that you can kind of negotiate with to figure out what those things are. What happens if uh, you have, you're in a position where you have a manager that you feel is holding you back? How do you address that? I love that question. A lot of people can't get ahead because they have managers who love them, but who don't have the social status and power to actually get ahead. You need to network with other higher status people at work. And I like to kind of go up and adjacent. So talking to other managers, you know, even outside of your immediate team, even outside of your function to find out how much social capital your manager actually has. You know, if they want to promote you, how much voice do they have in those rooms where those decisions are being made? And you can ask very critical questions during performance performance feedback, during interviews around what is the process through which people are promoted here, how long do they need to work here, how critical is it that their manager, you know, has the social capital to make those things actually happen for them early, early on in that process before you get to the point where you're realizing, I have a manager who loves me and wants to promote me, but they have zero ability to do so. You know, in this environment, I feel like, you know, or I feel like for years, people have said, you know, it's great when you can do multiple things. That's a good thing. You take on more and more responsibility, more roles. Is that a good or, good or bad thing, you think, in terms? I think it's a very dangerous thing. Why? Yeah, I think because we are in a kind of movement of busyness right now. We think more is better, and a lot of managers are asking us to do this instead of getting really good at a couple, a handful of roles and tasks. We are spread too thin. Um, we are taking on multiple things that don't add up to a path towards promotion or towards a raise. And we end up having resumes that look like we are all over the place. And one of the main criticisms I've heard from hiring managers is people have those resumes that say, you know, 2022 through present, 2023 through present. 14 times in a row on their resume, and it really looks like they have no idea what direction they're going in. They just say yes to everything in attempt to get ahead. So you have to exercise some restraint when it comes to taking on these roles and understand how these roles can actually build on one another to help you climb up instead of just spreading you out in a million different directions. Uh, okay, so one thing that we like to talk about is lessons, not just for people who are employees, but and, and, you know, who are targeted in the book, like don't necessarily like their jobs. What about lessons for managers who may have employees who aren't feeling like they're fulfilled at work? What lessons for managers can be taken away from the book? I think one of the more surprising things I learned in research for this book is that the signs that people are struggling, that they're having an identity crisis, that they're spread too thin, that they're drifting apart, are often the opposite of what we're trained to see. We're trained to look for disengagement, quiet quitting, but often those early signs are actually the opposite. When people are struggling with their identity, they're actually thinking of taking on a new career, they go all in at work. They take on more, they show up later. It's like an extinction burst. It's a little like when you're married and you go on a million dates right before you get a divorce to prove to yourself that you did everything you could. So managers actually need to learn to look out for some of those warning signs that I talk about that are often kind of things that are not in the zeitgeist. We're not talking about being really engaged when you're questioning your job or being sensitive to intermittent reinforcement or yeah. being on an emotional roller coaster, those kinds of things. Um, interesting, interesting. One of our fans of our show um, <laughs> said, you know, the most recent grads over four years have only known a bull market and hiring and hoard hoarding of employees. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with the stress of life once that cycle turns and we see unemployment tick up? I mean, Dr. West just got about 25 seconds. I mean, this has been a tight market. How does this stuff change <laughs> when it's not so easy to leave a job? Just quickly, very quickly. 
You really have to be ready to ride that roller coaster. Don't read too much into one emotion that you're feeling. And whatever you do, don't chase a job just because of the compensation package that comes along with it. Those things go up and down constantly. Yeah. That shouldn't be your primary motivator. All right, going to leave it there. Dr. Tessa West, professor of psychology at NYU. Her new book, uh, Job Therapy, Finding Work That Works For You. Um, that fan of the show also says you might like your job, but not your co-host. Cough, cough. Wow. <laughs> This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. It is Bloomberg Business Week. I think it's fair to say, Carol, that a lot of consumers' experience with the supply chain comes from when you can't get something. Absolutely. Right? They're like, oh, wait, this is going to take eight weeks to get. Now I'm interested in supply chains. It just, we all just assume it just shows up. Yeah. It's right? like during the great supply chain crunch that happened during COVID. As we know, though, now supply chains are incredibly complex and they're incredibly fragile. Yeah. Our next guest wants to modernize a specific part of the supply chain, material flow, the moving of raw materials and other components before they become things or those things that we all love to buy. And that's what he's doing. It's all happening at a company known as Mitra. It's a startup that's raised... $78 million. It's backed by companies including the food and drug retailer Albertsons. Chris Walty is co-founder and CEO at Mitra, and he joins us from Oregon. Chris, welcome. Um, you've got a really interesting... Thanks for having me. Yeah, you've got a really interesting career so far. Uh, seven years, more than seven years at Tesla before launching um, Mitra. You worked in mobile robotics. You ultimately worked for the humanoid, the Optimus humanoid robot. Um, during that time, what was the problem that you identified when you were at Tesla, that you built Mitra to solve? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, leading the, the material flow specifically to help Model 3 off the, the production line, as uh, as you may have known, Elon called it production hell. Oh, yeah. Um, there was he was sleeping on the, on the floor of the factory. <laughs> uh, yes, I think I tripped over him a few times um, <laughs> myself. Uh, it truly was challenging. Uh, it was a, a multi-month, multi-year effort to, to really get that spun up. And you know, one of the most common activities throughout the, the, the process, the one that I was uh, ultimately put in charge of because it was falling behind, was was simply getting parts to the Model 3 assembly line. Um, moving and storing material within the factory was was a huge challenge. Okay, so wait, wait, uh, so hold on. Let me, let's understand this. You, your job was to get the parts. They would come in from their suppliers or they would be fabricated there and yep. they would be stored in a certain area. And your job was to facilitate the transportation of those from wherever they were in the factory to the actual supply chain where it'd be assembled? Exactly. Yep. Just, you know, think pallets, move it from pallets down to kind okay. of cases and totes, breaking those apart, and then using things like conveyors and elevators to get them to exactly where they needed to be on the line. How does this not already happen? Well, it happens today um, in many factories. It happens through a lot of manual processes. In fact, 40% of the labor in any manufacturing facility is really just moving things around. Uh, and that's that number increases to about 80% uh, in a warehouse. And most of that is done the way it was 75 years ago today, through forklifts or people moving things manually. So what's the way that you can solve this and, and bring this up into the 21st century? Absolutely. So the, the goal of, of our company is to develop the simplest mechanism possible to do the most amount of work, and that is simply moving material up to 3,000 pounds. Uh, and when you think of a factory or warehouse, it's a large volumetric open space. I think everyone's been in a Costco before, right? You imagine just that that lo lots of airspace with racks and pallets. Um, and a lot of that uh, you know, doesn't really uh, require the sophistication and you know horsepower of of a person to do a lot of that Am uh, that challenge. Amazon bought this uh, company years ago, Kiva Systems. Is it right? Are you building something like if if that's the image that people have in their head of how something moves across a warehouse floor? Explain in the context of that, like use that as the reference point. How how is your solution different? Certainly. Yeah, Kiva is a phenomenal system. Um, it's really been beneficial to Amazon. What Kiva is really good at doing is bringing a lot of smaller bins, parts uh, to a particular area so that someone can pack it and put it in a parcel that is sent to probably your doorstep the next day. Um, that said, in the supply chain, most of what moves around in the supply chain moves around on pallets. You look around, everything you see around you has probably been on a pallet at some point or another. That's not really, you know, Kiva's bread and butter. It's not really designed for what's called 
parcel fulfillment. Um, most of the supply chain needs pallets, right? Um, our first customer, Albertsons, they run on pallets. Most industry runs on pallets. And so that's what we're moving around and we're doing it in an extremely simple and efficient way using mobile robots that move in any direction. And it seems like your systems, in terms of how they fit together, it's very simple, right? It's not a lot of moving parts to that. No, that was what it, I mean, it almost killed the company at Tesla. The amount of moving parts, the amount of things you had to plug in, commission, all of the motors, all of the sensors at the scale of a warehouse, uh, it's really challenging. And if you want to do full automation for these buildings today, that's kind of the the state of the art. Um, and that was the what, what one of our biggest struggles uh, at the company was. Um, led a team thereafter to try to build mobile robots to to solve uh, that problem at scale within Tesla. Um, and now we're trying to do that for the rest of the industry um, in much more of a, of a greenfield approach effectively. Chris, you mentioned um, working with Albertsons. Who else are you working with? Give us an idea of kind of the different types of companies that you are working with or planning to work with or hope to work with. Certainly. Well, as I mentioned, every, you know, supply chain moves, runs on pallets. I mean, every mm -hmm. industry from consumer packaged goods to retail, pharmaceuticals, uh, of course, automotive, um, you know, home goods, uh, you know, any of those folks uh, can benefit from from our system at some point in their supply chain. So um, the folks that we're, we're working with are, you know, Fortune 100 companies that have significant scale uh, to, to to apply this uh, throughout their ecosystem. Um, what type of an investment does a company have to make if they want to integrate Mitra into their supply chain because I'm looking at the website. Carol and I were looking at it earlier mm -hmm. in the day today Pretty as cool. we were preparing for this. It's really, really cool, but it also looks um, like it's a big investment. Sure. And that's one of the biggest challenges, right? I mean, if you're a supply chain company and it's challenging to know what your, what does your business look like 5, 10, even 15 years from now, investing in a lot of these fixed automation systems like you know we had to put in a Tesla uh, can be a bit challenging. Um, and so what we designed is a system that effectively, regardless of what your system needs to do five, 10 years from now, can flex, can change through software. You know, from a cost perspective, our North Star was, look, you know, 95% of these warehouses operate on pallets, pallet racks and forklifts. Um, you know, this has to be as easy to install and effectively as cost effective as a pallet rack um, and a forklift. So. Um, that is effectively our North Star. That's what we're driving towards. And you do that through a very, very simple system, um, orders of magnitude more simple than, than you know, the, the you know, kind of fixed automation that's out there today. Um, and so that's that's our North Star. Chris, I want one of these for my basement, basically. Uh, no, like, like you look be, at how this. Do you get it? How do you, no, do you get it to the main floor? You got to... <laughs> But it's, but it's this idea of like, you know what you do in a basement with those metal shelvings and you try to like have it all organized. It's like this on steroids. And I understand it's a, a much more sophisticated system. Having said that, I think we're trying to get like, what does this cost a company to do? And I understand this is one of those things that probably over time, but how expensive is a system like this? Certainly. So, you know, when you look at uh, on a cost per, per pallet position or a cost per um, per pallet stored, right? This is, you know, our North Star is, is pretty equivalent to what you would, would need to, to, to spend to outfit your warehouse with, you know, call it single beat pallet racking, which is, I mean, today those can be, you know, 100 to, you know, $700 a position. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty wide range and a lot of it depends on, are you in an earthquake zone? Are you, you know, in an area, area with, with hurricanes, et cetera? Um, so it really, you know, the vast majority of the fixed infrastructure is just in a very simple steel rack. Um, and that's a, that's a, it's a pretty well, really, it's just the cost of steel effectively. It's a pretty cool system. Very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, highly recommend everybody check it out on the website. Well, keep in touch and let us know how things are going as you guys, as you continue to build it out, like fascinating background and certainly uh, interesting to see what you guys are uh, up to. Chris, thank you so much. Chris Walty, really appreciate you joining us. Co-founder and CEO at Mitra, joining us from Oregon. All right, you're going to thank us for this segment uh, in a big way. Skin cancer, my own family having uh, their own scare recently around this. Many of my extended family have dealt with these concerns. Uh, I'm big, I got to say, Tim, on those full body checks. Do it every year. I got one on Tuesday morning. You did.
<laughs> so to get aware for the summer and sunny summer sunning season, with us is Ashani Weratna, chair of the biochemistry and molecular biology department at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Ashani, welcome. Um, we got lots and lots of questions for you. So we're so glad to have you <laughs> with us. I what I, I do want to start with sunscreen, though, because we know we're supposed to wear sunscreen every day, regardless of how much time we spend outside. But one thing I don't understand is, is it OK to wear chemical sunscreens or should we move completely away from chemical sunscreens and instead use sunscreens with metals in them like zinc? That's a great question, and it's a question that a lot of people have concerns about. The truth is that there's no real evidence showing that the chemical sunscreens are dangerous mm. for your health. And what I advise people to do is if they are really concerned about it, there are so many great lines of UPF clothing that are available now, um, including long sleeve t-shirts, hats, and that sort of thing. And as you just mentioned, the zinc oxide based sunscreens are fantastic. So I don't think there's a need to move away from chemical sunscreens because, again, there's no hard evidence that they are dangerous. But, However, I do think it's important to have other options. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the hats and the um, and the long sleeves. You should see me at the beach. I'm no fun to go to the beach with because I just stay <laughs> under an umbrella and with or, like long sleeves on the whole time and I'm grumpy. Well, um, you get a gold star from me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there are we, but we do have to put sunblock on our face and on our, our nose. Like, do you recommend a zinc sunscreen? over a chemical sunscreen or we're not at that point? I honestly do not okay. because I use chemical sunscreens myself and on my children and um, I don't see a need to switch. Hmm. However, again, if someone is concerned, obviously we have great zinc oxide sunscreens. What about though kind of like I'm someone who's embraced kind of the more natural or non-chemical things. Are they, they seem to work as well do they or like what's some advice in terms of how we should pick a sunscreen whether we you know aren't so worried about the chemicals in there or you know we go is there some way of kind of filtering through sure so the most important uh speaking of filtering the most important thing for a sunscreen is to make sure that it is a broad spectrum sunscreen it needs to be able to block both UVA rays and UVB rays. Hmm. So those are two different kinds of UV rays. They penetrate different layers of the skin, and it's really, really important to block both of those. So wherever you are looking for a sunscreen, no matter if it is you know, natural-based, chemical-based, um, uh, physically-based, make sure it says that it's a broad-spectrum sunscreen. I would also uh, stick with the sunscreens that are FDA regulated because you know they are safe mm. uh, and they have been tested to do what they're supposed how, to do. How do you know if a sunscreen is FDA regulated? It will usually say it. It will huh. say it on it. What about like, you know, um, SPF 10, SPF 30, SPF yes. a million? Like, does it, is there a point where it's just sure. ridiculous? <laughs> Yeah. So actually, you know, we recommend anything that is SPF 30 is probably just fine. Um, you'll see SPF 50, SPF 70. All that means is that you can stay out longer in the sun without reapplying. But the truth is SPF 30 is probably um, at this at this point in time, SPF 30 is a completely comfortable SPF factor with which to stick if you're interested in. But if you're really you know. fair, like, would you go, would you suggest that you go for a higher SPF? So, um, no, because the higher SPF you go, it's not a linear um, increase, if you will, in protection. So my advice would be rather than go for an SPF 70, buy an SPF 30, but reapply ah. uh, more often okay. and consistently. We suggest that you reapply, especially if you're sweating or swimming, at least every 80 to 90 minutes when you're out in the sun, which I don't think most people do because I have so many people say, Oh, we, we put our sunblock on, but we still got burned. And then I asked them, did you reapply? And often they say, no. So. Is, is what, this is a real question. I'm not just asking this because this is what I deal with every morning. But truly, <laughs> why is it so difficult to put sunscreen on kids? And what are some good strategies <laughs> to get yeah. kids not to scream at you when you're trying to yes, put sunscreen I, on? You know, honestly, 
it is a challenge. I remember when my daughter was in kindergarten, uh, I got all the kids to the point in her class where they would just line up in front of me and oh. I would cover them and with some. Can you come over tomorrow morning? <laughs> What's that? Can you come over tomorrow morning? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. Yeah, um, so again, with kids, you know, there's these great lines of the SPF clothing, and that is a lot easier. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, as with everything, getting them to eat, getting them to wear their sunscreen, <laughs> it's just a struggle. And I wish I had a better answer for ha- you. Having <laughs> said that, I actually had a pediatrician who was like, back off the sunscreen a little bit because kids were being so covered in sunscreen concerns what? about, was it, vit- was it vitamin D, like not oh, getting sunscreen? Okay, I want to hear the answer to this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sure. I- so the truth is that to get the amount of vitamin D that you need um, for your body to function properly, you only need 15 minutes in sunlight. Huh. And often we get that 15 minutes, even if we're wearing sunscreen, because nobody's going to reapply at the exact second they need to reapply. And so if you're out in the sun at all, you're getting the the, sun, the sunlight that you need to make the vitamin D. So it's a little bit of a, um, a flawed argument to say, don't use sunscreen because you won't get vitamin D. More of a concern is don't let your kids sit in the basement playing video games because then they definitely won't get their vitamin D. And I will say the caveat was, you know, basically put it on when it's like supreme sun hours, Mm. like the peak hours, but you can, you know, there could be hours a day where they're not slathered in sunscreen. Okay, do Carol and I really have to put on, do we really have to put on sunblock every single morning when we leave? our homes to come to the office, even in the dead of winter? I've got pretty thick makeup on. That's not going to do it. (laughs) So I actually have makeup that has an SPF 15 in it. And that's what I use. Um, And, you know, when you're sitting inside an office all day, or um, as you say, you know, we get significant sun exposure even in the winter. And if you are someone who skis, Mm. for example, that is you actually get a double exposure of the sun because if you're on the slopes yeah. the sun bounces off the snow and 80 percent right. of it reflects back on you yeah. um like on so water. right yeah. and uh just yeah. to your earlier point yeah. um the the just... peaks of hours are between 10 and 4. oh okay good to know good to know Ashani, thank you so much she's chair of the biochemistry and molecular biology department at the johns hopkins bloomberg school of public health Ashani, we are at uh over the johns hopkins bloomberg school of public health that is supported by michael r bloomberg founder of bloomberg lp and bloomberg philanthropies